Testing. Hello. Ah, there we go. Sorry, I'm just testing the mic.
Okay, I guess we'll get started. Uh, so welcome to SIS220 system level programming. Um, for those of you watching on the live stream, if there are any, it doesn't look like there's many. Um, hopefully you can hear this. I don't have a good way to monitor it, so um, sorry about that. Um, okay, who am I? Uh, so I'm uh, Dr. Burton Ma. I'm, uh, this is the second year I've been at Queen's, so I started during COVID. Um, I'm actually Queen's alumnus, so I'm Psi 94, Comp Psi 96, and then a PhD with Randy Ellis in 2005. Um, and then I left and went to York University to teach uh, and do research, and now I'm back. Uh, my office is on the seventh floor of Goodwin, but you probably won't be using, uh, you probably won't be seeing me in person very much, right? So office hours are virtual on Teams, uh, so every Thursday from 2.30 to 4, uh, I have dedicated uh, office hours. You just jump on Teams uh, for this class, and I'll be there. Um, you can, if, you, that, if that time doesn't work for you, uh, you can make an appointment. So just send me an email. When you send me an email, um, make sure to, did that change? No, no, sorry, hang on. Make sure that you, so let me uh, grab this. Right, make sure that you put CISC 220 in the subject line. Right, so I teach um, two courses this term, and if you just send me an email without telling me what course you're in, I don't know how to address your issue. Right, so make sure you put the, the, course, code, the course code somewhere in the email. Uh, if you do wanna see me in person, I will be in my office at that time. Right, but I can't have, uh, it's not good having a whole bunch of you show up uh, during office hours. Um, because uh, if, if, you've been in the stair, if you've been in the halls of Goodwin Hall, Sorry, if you've been upstairs in Goodwin Hall, the hallways are very narrow. Right? You basically one or two people, you can fit two people side by side and that's it. Right? So um, if there's like 10 of you waiting outside the hallway, that's not gonna be great. Um, if you wanna see me in person, the best way to do it is to make an appointment. Uh, you can try dropping by, um, but, don't be, uh, but if there's lots of people uh, hanging around, I'm gonna have to sort of, I don't know. We'll have to do something about it, right? Okay. Um, Email. Uh, my email address is there, right? Uh, again, if you uh, choose to email me, uh, put SIS220 in the subject line. If you try to message me on Teams, uh, I'm probably not gonna see it um, because there's too many ways for, uh, there's too many things for me to monitor, too many forms of communication for me to monitor. Uh, so email is the best way to get a hold of me. All right, uh, you have four teaching assistants. There's supposed to be a fifth, but uh, the TAs keep on declining uh, their assignment. Uh, so we're having a hard time finding another TA. And there are quite a lot of you in this course. Uh, so hopefully we get that sorted out. Um, uh, the contact information for the TAs will be posted on OnQ uh, as soon as I, as soon as, sorry, as soon as the contracts get finalized. Uh, the TAs will have office hours as well, right? So each TA will have one hour a week sometime uh, where you can uh, jump onto Teams and meet with them. Um, if you don't want to talk to them, if you don't, uh, if you can't reach me, um, or if you would rather speak to a TA about um, mostly the assignment material and any uh, any assignment marking, okay? Um, you'll get uh, you'll be told who marks your assignments so you know which TA to contact about that sort of thing. Uh, and if you can't resolve it with the TA, that's when you uh, ask me about it, okay? It's not a problem. Course information, everything will eventually be on OnQ, um, but it's not there right now. There's very little on OnQ right now. Um, uh, but it will be there shortly. So lectures are live streamed, as you uh, hopefully know, right? So they're live streamed and they are also recorded. Um, so uh, after the, sometime later today, I'll put a recording of the lecture up on the lectures page. Um, and so you have lots of ways to access the lecture information. 
right? You can either come to class, watch it on the live stream, watch it later on your own time, right? That URL should never change, right? So if you need to watch the lecture on the live stream for whatever reason, right, that URL should never change. Uh, when you access that URL, uh, you'll have to log in with your Queen's uh, net ID and password, right? So uh, all of the um, streaming sites, all of the live lecture streaming sites are password protected. Um, and it's because it's actually costing Queens a lot of money uh, to do this this year, right? But um, uh, the decision was made to actually do this this year uh, because of the situation that we're in. Okay, there is no built-in disadvantage uh, for not coming to class, right? So if you don't come to class, you're not really losing out, except uh, you can't ask me questions directly here, right? But that's why there's office hours and things like that. Um, if you're watching the live stream and you have a question, you know, just fire me an email and I'll get to it at the end of, uh, at the, end of, a, uh, of the lecture. There's not really a good way for me to monitor the live stream and lecture at the same time. Right? Basically, I'd have to set up a Teams meeting or something like that and I'd have to be watching people on the live stream. I'd have to, watch, I'd have to be watching for questions from students watching the live stream while also trying to lecture. Uh, and that's not really going to work very well. Right? So no disadvantage. Right? If, you, if you can't be here for whatever reason, uh, don't worry about it, right? And I, if you're sick, you're not feeling well, please don't come to class, just watch the live stream, right? Or watch the video later, right? Okay. Textbooks, there is no, uh, no required textbook in this course, right? It's ridiculous to make you buy a textbook for this course. Uh, everything you need to know you can find online for free in any one of millions of resources. Right? There are course notes that were written specifically for the course. Right? So if you want to go ahead and read those, go ahead and read those. Right? They're very, uh, what's the best word for it? They're very terse. Right? So there's not a lot of explanation. It's just, this is blah, and away you go. Right? So there's not a whole lot of explanation in the notes. The library has excellent online books. Right? So the two that I've listed there, again, you don't have to copy down the URL, just look at the lecture side later. Right? It's also going to be on OnQ. Um, so there's two excellent online books uh, that have, uh, as far as I know, there's no restrictions on how many students can look at the book at the same time. Right, so they're right there. So the Linux command line second edition uh, is a very um, well-reviewed and loved book. And Modern C, again, is another um, very well-reviewed uh, book for C. The standard book that used to be used in this course is the C programming language by Kernighan and Ritchie. I don't know why anybody uses that book anymore. Um, that book describes C from 20 years ago, more or less, right? Um, so I'm using this one. You can use Kernighan and Ritchie if you want, right? It is a classic, right? And there's lots of, uh, there's lots of classic C books uh, for the C part of this course, right? Okay, any questions so far? Anybody, anybody, any? all right. Grading, um, okay, so this is how your grading's gonna, this is how grading works in this course. Right, there's six assignments. The first one is smaller, right? So that's gonna come out uh, sometime early next week, right? So it's gonna be a little bash um, uh, assignment for you. And that's to make sure that you've actually got some sort of, um, some sort of envir environment set up on your computers that's suitable for this course. And I'll explain exactly what you need to do. Uh, and then there's another two somewhat larger um, assignments. And then you can see there's three assignments in C. Right, so this course is basically split into two parts, and uh, I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, there is a midterm, it's online on OnQ. Uh, the midterm is held during one of the lecture times, so obviously there's no lecture that day. Right, so you can go to the library or stay at home or wherever you need to be to do the uh, midterm. The exam, however, is in person and it is, uh, it is uh, managed by the exam office. Uh, so you do have to come to the, your, you do have to write a written exam, right? Obviously that changes the types of questions that you get asked on the exam, right? This is largely a programming course. So, you know, when you get asked a programming question on an exam, you have to fill it in in pen and paper, right? So obviously we're not checking for, uh, we're not checking very hard for syntax and stuff like that, right? Similarly, I don't ask questions that make you pretend to be a compiler, right? So I don't ask you, why doesn't this compile? Because it's a programming course. You should have a compiler in front of you, right? It's ridiculous. I don't ask those types of questions. Uh, okay, uh, any questions about the grading? Anybody? Great. 
uh, assignments. So uh, assignments are done individually in this course, right? It's the best way to learn is if you do your own work. Um, solutions, okay, so the way this course works is 72 hours after the uh, assignment due date, the solutions come out, right? So you get fully worked solutions uh, for every assignment that you do in this course. You get fully worked uh, solutions for the midterm. Uh, you'll probably get them for the exam, right? It's fine. Um, now, because I'm giving you the fully worked solutions, I can't accept work after 72 hours, right? Because, you know, you just look at the solutions and then you copy them and away you go, right? So there is a late submission policy. Um, so nothing is accepted once the solutions go up, right? And that includes students with academic accommodations, right? So for the students with accommodations, if this doesn't work for you, you have to contact me uh, and we'll have to arrange something else. Uh, basically, the way it works is you lose some percentage of marks for every day it's late, right? So one minute late, you're marked out of 90%. Two min uh, a day and one minute late, you're marked out of 80%. And then uh, two days and one minute late, you're marked out of uh, 70%, right? And then after that, the assignment's gone, right? Okay, the midterm is online. Uh, I already told you that, right? Yeah, so it's online, no lecture that day. Um, I will post the date soon for the uh, date of the uh, midterm. It'll be probably the week after reading week, I think, because we're not gonna finish um, the first half of the course until sometime in week five. Uh, so that puts the earliest reasonable time after reading week. Um, it only covers the first half of the course, right? So it's not gonna cover any C programming in that part. And the exam, as I said, is uh, administered by the exam office. Three hours closed book uh, only includes a little bit from the first half, mostly the second half. Oops, sorry. All right, so what is this course all about? Uh, so this is a system level programming course. Uh, so system level basically means um, a lower level than you're used to working at uh, so far, right? So, so far you've been making um, either some sort of small desktop application, right? Where either you type something into a console or you type something into the command line um, where you're doing, you're giving a program some input or uh, you may have done some sort of graphical stuff, right? This happens at a lower level. So this is the basic concepts of Unix-like systems. Uh, shells and scripting, uh, which is basically the first half of the course. And then system level programming in the C language, which is the second half of the course, right? Now, the reason this course exists, uh, one of the main reasons it exists is because uh, some of your second year, third year, and fourth year courses uh, are taught in C, or they use C somehow, right? C or C++. Um, and so at some point in time, you need to learn, um, it would be useful if someone taught you C, right? Also, a lot of the CAST lab, if you've used it so far, um, a lot of the courses will be using CAST lab in Linux mode, so it's, you need to be able to uh, work in a Linux environment, right? That's the first half of the course. So we're gonna learn about an operating system named Linux. Uh, it's actually named uh, GNU Linux, but whatever, right? We're gonna use something called the bash shell, and you'll be writing what are called bash shell scripts, right? And then you're gonna program in C, okay? Now, if this is in Linux, oh, sorry, let me, uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so, well, what's an operating system, right? Um, if this is an operating, if this is a systems level course, right, you need to know what an operating system is. So your operating system is just, it's software, right? So it's the software that manages your computer hardware, right? Uh, so you can imagine, yeah, right here. So it's the thing in blue, right? So you can imagine you've got hardware in your computer. You've got some sort of program that you're using, right? Microsoft Word, something else, some video game, something like that, right? Um, so that's your application. Right? You're the user, obviously. Somewhere between the application and the hardware, though, sits the operating system. Right? So the operating system basically provides an interface for other programs to access the hardware. Right? So it's abstraction all over again. Right? So in CISC 121 and 124, at some point, you came across the term abstraction. Right? The operating system abstracts the hardware so that other software can use it in a sensible way right? or in an easier way. Oh, sorry. What's going on? 
OK, now most of the operating systems you've used, right? So you've, used, uh, you've probably used Windows and or Microsoft and possibly Chrome OS, right? It's, uh, some of you may have used, actually, has anybody used Linux in here? Anybody? OK, is anybody routinely using Linux in here? So is it your desktop? Good. Super. OK, so for those of you who are using Linux as your desktop uh, or have been using it for a while, this course will be a breeze, I think. Um, now, for the rest of you, you're used to pointing and clicking it. Actually, even if you're using a modern Linux desktop, you're probably still pointing and clicking at stuff, right? So most, um, uh, most modern desktops have some sort of graphical interface to them, right? You've got a mouse, you've got a keyboard, you can point at things, you can type things in, so on and so forth, right? That's the way we like to interact with our, um, uh, that's the way most people like to interact with our operating systems, right? Uh, if you're on a gaming console, you've got your gaming controller, right? So that's how you interact with your, uh, with your operating system. So there's an alternate way uh, to interact with many, but not all, operating systems, right? Uh, but, yeah. Um, so there's something called a command line interface, right? And that's basically, uh, you get a window, you can type in the window and enter commands by typing uh, directly into the window and pressing enter, right? Uh, and most of this course is basically getting you to use a command line interface, right? Uh, and you're going to interact, in this case, with the Linux operating system, right? Now, Windows also has a command line interface, right? So you can grab uh, either the Windows command shell or Windows PowerShell or something else, right? And anything, well, not anything. You can do a lot uh, on your computer just by typing into a command window, right? Rather than pointing and clicking. For some things, it's a lot faster to actually type than it is to uh, point and click. Uh, and you're going to see lots of examples of that uh, as we go through the course. OK, so what's GNU Linux? Right? Uh, there's a link there that uh, takes you to the, uh, uh, so linux.org is basically the home site, I guess the home web page of Linux. Right? Uh, there's a little uh, what is Linux link here. right? Um, to, I guess tomorrow's the next lecture, right? So tomorrow I'll talk a little bit more about what Linux is and its history. Not a whole lot more, right? But a little bit more. But in brief, uh, GNU Linux is free, right? Uh, it's open source, right? Meaning anybody can uh, look at the source code. Um, free open source operating system. It's widely used on uh, servers, so the, the infrastructure that runs the internet, right? Mainframes, so the infrastructure that runs lots of big business. Supercomputers uh, and embedded devices. So little things like that clock, for example, would be an example of an embedded device, right? Somewhere in that clock, there's a CPU of some kind, right? Is it running Linux? I have no idea. But lots of little uh, devices um, have, uh, are running some, fo some form of embedded Linux, right? So most people, when they say Linux, they mean the Linux operating system uh, and, it's, uh, and all of the software that comes with it. Right? So most people don't say GNU Linux. They just say Linux. And that's what I'm going to do from now on. OK, so if this is a Linux course and most of you don't have Linux machines, how do you access Linux? Right? So for those of you on Mac, actually, I'm curious how many of you actually do use Mac here. Is it also oh, quite a, about a third? Maybe a little more. OK. Um, OK, for those of you on Mac, uh, congratulations, you don't have to do anything for now, right? Uh, Mac OS is close enough uh, to Linux for our purposes, right? So on Mac, if you open up a terminal, right, uh, you don't get a bash shell, you get something called a Z shell. Uh, but there's a, it's easy to switch to the bash shell if you want to. Uh, and the Z shell is actually sort of compatible with the bash shell, right? So for, uh, for the next five weeks, Mac users, you don't have to do anything to, uh, uh, to, get, to, to get a Suitable, a suitable programming environment, right? Windows, you have a slightly bigger problem, but it's an easy problem to fix now, right? So in Windows, so if any, well, I guess it's easy if you don't have an ancient computer, right? So as long as your computer is not older than, um, I guess, five years-ish, five years, and as long as your operating system has been updated, right, which isn't always the case, right? Um, you can probably install what's called the Linux subsystem for Windows, right? In other words, uh, Microsoft has provided a way to actually run Linux on your Windows operating system without having to do anything elaborate, okay? So if you follow that link, 
right? Microsoft has a very nice web page that shows you how to install the Windows subsystem for Linux. Follow the instructions carefully. It's easy to miss. Uh, there's one part that's really easy to miss something. Uh, and I don't remember what it is. Uh, but I missed it and I wouldn't install. So um, it's easy to miss it. So you have to follow the instructions carefully, right? But if you do, there's only a few. It's not, it's not long, right? Follow the instructions. You'll end up with, a, you'll end up with Linux on your, um, on your Windows machine. I'm going to show you that shortly. Uh, now, you probably, when you're programming, you probably don't want to use a command line editor, right? So uh, it's true, you can run an editor in your little command line window. Um, I do not want to inflict that pain on you, okay? Um, for those of you who've used Linux, you've used Vim or Emacs or something like that, maybe Nano, I guess. Um, they're no fun. The editors are, uh, there's, the, the editors all have a fairly steep learning curve, okay? Um, it used to be the case that, well, many years ago, like when I was an undergrad, uh, you basically had to learn VI or Emacs or something like that. Uh, not anymore. So on Windows, just uh, install Visual Studio Code, and then uh, get the plugin that hooks Visual Studio Code up to the uh, Linux subsystem. Um, it's amazing that this, this works, right? So, um, so you can basically do all of your editing in Visual Studio Code, okay? If you're on Mac, just get any text editor, right? Just Google for some programming text editor, it doesn't matter which one, right? Um, I guess the other way to do it is to install Xcode, which you're gonna have to do later anyway, right? And that should come with an editor as well, right? But you need a text editor of some kind, not a word processor, right? Text editor, plain text editor. Um, you've all taken 124, Eclipse is not so good for this sort of thing. Uh, you can make it work, but I wouldn't, uh, on Windows, I don't know how to hook Eclipse up to the, to the Linux subsystem. Okay? Now, if you don't want to go through the trouble of setting up your, oh, there's other options if you're on Windows, right? If you're in Windows, you can install Linux, right? You should probably dual boot your system if you're going to do this, right? In other words, don't wipe out your entire Windows installation and put Linux on. I don't recommend doing that. You can, but I don't recommend doing it. Uh, you can dual boot it. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do in the world, right? Uh, but it's possible. So you can install Linux on your, um, on your computer. You can install a virtual, some sort of virtual machine emulator on your computer and then install Linux into the virtual machine. That's doable. Uh, again, assuming you have a fairly newish computer, right? If it's too old, uh, the emulation probably won't work. Uh, the other way to do it is to get what's called a uh, Linux Live installation on a USB and run it off the USB. Um, if I have some, if I can make enough time, I will try to get that working uh, for you. Uh, so that's kind of nice because then all your stuff's on the USB key and you don't have to worry about mucking around on your computer, right? And you actually get a working version of Linux. Uh, okay, if you don't want to do any of that, which is fine, right? There's CastLab, right? So CastLab has Linux on it, right? So you uh, just boot the computer into Linux mode if it's not already there, uh, and away you go, right? You have some, I think it's Ubuntu in there. I'm not 100% sure, right? But you have a perfectly suitable version of um, uh, Linux there. Okay, now for your assignments, because you're all working, you're probably all going to be working in some, uh, in a different environment, right? Someone's going to be doing on Mac, someone's going to be in Windows, someone's going to be on some other version of Linux. You have to make sure that the code you submit actually runs on the CastLab computers, right? So at some point in time, hit that link, right? Find out how to get yourself a CastLab account if you don't have one, right? And then when, uh, before you submit your assignments, make sure everything you do runs on a CastLab computer, right? Uh, there's a lot of information on these links that's easy to miss. So hang on, let me uh, show you that. Uh, so if you hit that link, uh, you will end up uh, where, here? Not here. Um, here. No, nope, not here either. Sorry, cast lab. Okay, so you'll end up here. Right? Uh, now, it's not entirely clear, but all the links over here are related to CastLab. Right? If you have a problem accessing CastLab, uh, don't email me because I can't help you. Right? Uh, I don't have administrator privileges in CastLab. So if you go to contact us, right, you'll, see, you'll get an email address for the person you should contact if you're having trouble accessing CastLab. Right? Uh, yeah, so Profs don't have any sort of uh, administrator access on the uh, computing systems, which is a good thing, right? 
It's a very good thing. You don't want your profs being responsible for your um, cash lab accounts. OK, any questions so far? Anybody? All right. Um, silly command line fun. OK, so basically, I'm going to give you a very quick demo of what it's like to use a command line interface. Right? Um, now, if you're using Windows, right, and you've installed the Linux subsystem uh, recently, right, and you want to repeat what I'm doing here, in the console, you have to type sudo apt update to update, the cons to update your uh, Linux installation. Otherwise, you won't be able to install this software that I'm about to run. Okay. Where did my, oh, that's what's going on. Okay, that is what you see when you use a command line interface, right? Uh, so basically, this thing looks like um, if you've seen any movies or TV shows, that are showing you a very, very, very old computer, right? It used to be the case that you would sit down at this box, there would be a monitor, a CRT screen, right? Not even a flat screen, right? You'd have to use these old CRT screens. Um, and you'd see this glowing green or orange or white text, right? And you'd see people typing into it, right? That's basically what a command line interface is, right? And so this is an example of one. So this is, um, this is a command line, so this is uh, running in the Windows subsystem, right? And so this is, a, this is a Ubuntu command shell. Um, and so the way this thing works is uh, there's no mouse, right? So notice that there's, uh, there's, a, my, there's my cursor because it's Windows, right? But you, the blinking cursor, I can't drag that around with the mouse, right? Everything you do, you type. So uh, in order to use this thing, right, you need to know what the commands are that you can actually type in uh, to this console, right? So I can do something like date. Right? So what does date do? Well, not surprisingly, it prints out today's date and time. Right? So not the most exciting thing. Right? I can type in Cal. Cal prints out a calendar for this month. Right? The commands are a little more sophisticated than this. So for example, you can get the calendar for the previous month. You can get the calendar for the next month. Right? Uh, and now you might ask, well, how do I know that I can get the calendar for the previous month? Or how do I know that I can get the calendar for the next month, right? Is there some book or somewhere where this is written down that I have to read and memorize? The answer is no, right? Built, in to the, um, built into this shell, right? There's something called the man pages, right? So if you want information on the command, you type man followed by the command name and you press enter, right? And you get this abomination, right? You have to get used to reading this, okay? This is what you're going to have to get used to doing when you're working with a command line interface. Right? Nobody, I'm pretty sure nobody, knows everything about every command that you can run uh, in, a, in a Linux shell. Right? So all the documentation is provided in the form of what are called man pages. Right? And you can see here that the commands, there's a lot of stuff. Right? Uh, indicating that, uh, so indicating that there's probably a lot of stuff that this thing can do, right? Later on in the course, we'll learn, we'll look at more of these man pages and learn how to read them and navigate them and so on and so forth, right? How long does this man page go on for? Do, quite a while, right? So it goes on for quite a while, right? But this is the standard form, one of the standard forms in which documentation is provided to you, right? Now, of course, you can look it up on the internet too, right? But um, if you're just working on a command line interface, this is what you're faced with, right? Oh, Q. There we go. OK. What else did I want to show you? OK. Uh, OK. Now, um, you might want to know, right? Well, I've got this command line interface. You know, I've got some files on this computer somewhere. Right? How do I know what files are currently are on this computer? Right? Well, there's this command called L. There is a command called ls, right? Which will list the contents of whatever folder my terminal is currently in. Right? And there's nothing here apparently. Right? Which isn't true. Right? I can use what's called a command line option. So minus sign indicates an option. AL means uh, list everything. 
And you can see, oh, there actually is some stuff here, right? So these are the files that are in what are called my home directory. Um, anything that starts with a period indicates a uh, hidden file, right? So it's a, um, some sort of system configuration file or some sort of configuration file, not necessarily system, right? So there are, in fact, a bunch of files here, right? So that's the ls command. Now, if I accidentally type sl, I get this, <laughs> right? So you can imagine, right, when you're typing on a console, it's very easy uh, to make mistakes, right? Uh, ls is probably one of the most common commands that are used, right? Because you're always, you want to know, right? You can imagine if you're working on your console, you need to know what files are in your directory. You're going to be using ls a lot, right? It's easy to type sl, right? So just for so fun, some programmer somewhere made the sl program, which is short for steam locomotive, right? And when you run the steam locomotive, that is in fact what you get, right? Okay. So what else do we have here? Fortune, right? And there's lots of these little fun commands uh, that programmers have made up, right? Because programmers aren't busy at all and they have lots of free time, right? Fortune. So Fortune is a little program that randomly reads, well, that reads some file somewhere, right? That contains a bunch of short little fortunes, right? right? So apparently, I'm going to be traveling and coming into a fortune, which is nice, right? Run it again, you get a different one, right? So you get a quote from William Shakespeare, and then you run it again. So you can see it's grabbing these random quotes or phrases um, from somewhere, right? It's just, they're located in files on the operating system somewhere. Do, do, right, that's, uh, I guess that's a computer science joke, right? And so on and so forth. Kausei. Oh, Kausei is fun. Okay. Uh, command. So Kausei is a little program that draws a cow that says whatever you tell it to. So, hello? There's your cow that says hello. Right? We can make it say some other things. Kausei. Sys220. Sys220. Right now, the power of the win uh, the power of the command line is that you can take the output from a program and send it to the input of another program, right? And you can chain commands, right, to do very, very, very complicated tasks, right? So one of the underlying design features of the operating system where this all came from, right, it's an operating system called Unix. Right? The Unix philosophy says that the Unix tools should all do one thing. Each tool should do one thing, and it should do it well. Right? So all of these little programs that I'm typing in, they do one thing. Right? They, they, they do one task. Right? And they're very capable at doing that one task. So the way you build more complicated programs in a Unix environment is you chain these tools together. So we know Fortune prints out a fortune, right? But I can send this fortune to cow say, and I can make the cow say the fortune, right? So I can do what's called a pipe, right? And now the cow will print out a random fortune. You will be advanced socially without any special effort on your part. That's nice, right? <laughs> Advancement in position, also nice. Some of the fortunes, I think, are bad fortunes. <laughs> Right? You were confused, but this is your own, see? This is perfect. Right? It's perfect. Right? You can keep on going. I don't know. There's like, there's like thousands of these things, right? Um, so, uh, yeah. So every time you run it, you're going to get a random fortune. Right? Cow say toilet. Okay. Well, let's try this. Um, I actually don't remember what toilet does, so let's see what it does. Uh, it does nothing. Okay. Toilet, hello. So here's another command. Oh, here's what it does. It's a toilette. It's not toilet. It's toilette, right? It's it's French, so it's sophisticated, right? So uh, this basically prints out whatever you uh, tell it to using some sort of uh, large, large font made up of individual characters, right? And just like the cow, 
you can pipe the input, the output from some program into Toilette. So I can take the output from Fortune and send it to Toilette. And there you go. Snow day, stay home. <laughs> Perfect. Right? Can, can I send this to Kause? I've never tried it. Let's find out. Yes, you can. <laughs> Amazing. I guess this is the nice thing about a live lecture, is that you can get questions from students on things you've never thought of trying to do. Right? I never thought to do this. But it's a perfectly reasonable question to ask when you think about it. All right, one more thing, and then we're going to end the lecture for today, and we'll start the actual work tomorrow, I guess. Uh, sorry, what was that command? I just lost it again. C matrix. C matrix. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is actually uh, appropriate because uh, the, um, the Matrix teaser trailer, the Matrix 4 teaser trailer dropped yesterday. Oh, hey, look. Oh, this is perfect. This is exactly what I wanted to do. Okay, so look. If you're in, uh, when you're working in Windows, um, sorry, when you're working in the Windows sub, the Linux subsystem for Windows, right? If you try to do what I did, none of the commands will work because they're not installed on your computer by default. So you have to install them yourself. If you're in Mac, unfortunately, you can't run these, right? Well, you can, but it's a lot harder, right? But the Bash shell is smart enough to know, hey, there might actually be a command somewhere in the world that corresponds with this one. And it tells you how to install it. So you just follow the instructions, sudo apt install. See. And it's going to go out onto the internet from somewhere. It's going to grab that program. It's going to install it on your computer. It's going to register the, compu the program with the, Linux, with the operating system. And now I can run cmatrix. There you go. <laughs> right? And there you go. Can you pipe this to Kalsay? I have no idea. Try <laughs> it. I have no idea. Right? And so there you go. So, sorry? I suspect it's not going to work, but yes, we can try it. I don't think it's going to work because, uh, yeah, it's not going to work. OK. Uh, right. OK, so one more thing before we go. When you're typing in a bunch of commands, Right? It's often the case that you want to go back to a previous command. Right? So your shell has what's called the command history. This is true on Mac, too. Right? So if you use the up and down cursor keys, you can go back to any command. Right? So you don't have to type it back in again. You can just find the one you typed in. You can also ask, hey, what commands did I type in? And there they all are. Right? And so um, I'll show you how to use all these tools and more. Um, as the course progresses, right? And so that's it for today. I'll see you tomorrow.